seems good evening to you all. Tuesday night, so that means uh, we'll endeavour to answer a few of your questions that you've sent in. So, uh, first question. Lumpur, I do 20 minutes of metta whilst walking medit walking preceding vipassana. Is it all right to do metta in all postures? Uh, well, first thing, what does it mean to do metta? I think it means to focus your mind or recollect the object of metta. So metta means goodwill, loving kindness, loving friendliness. That's the object, so it's a positive emotion. It's one of the Brahma Viharas, one of the dwelling place of the Brahma gods, one of the sublime attitudes. So doing metta means keeping that object, that positive emotion in mind. And I think it's quite natural if you are developing that regularly, it will be in your mind in any posture. So if you've been meditating, sitting down, developing the object of metta, loving kindness, when you get up and go away to do something else, it, that thought and that emotion is not just going to disappear. It will stay with you, at least for a while. So then you'll be doing it as you walk away from your meditation cushion. Or if you are standing doing something, it will be with you. If you meditate before you go to bed at night, you might sit meditation, developing metta, as many people do. Then you lie down to go to sleep. Well, you'll still have the object of metta in mind when you're lying down. And that is a very good way to prepare to go to sleep. Spread, all, spread the thought of loving kindness in all directions around you. And if one attains samadhi, then quite, again, quite naturally, there'll be a lot of loving kindness in the mind in all postures. Of course it can disappear because it's still a sankhara, it's impermanent and when the conditions are right, we are tempted, uh, we are triggered, our button is pushed, and we might fall into anger or ill will. Our metta will disappear. But you can regain it in any posture. And we should aim to do that. And another point is that when you develop any meditation, whether it's mindfulness of breathing, you focus your mind on the object of loving kindness, or you contemplate death, or you recollect the Buddha, for example, you know, any meditation object, you're learning to still the mind, quiet in the mind by focusing on an object. And naturally you'll be overcoming, overcoming the five hindrances as you do that. So if you're successful with any kind of meditation, ill will will fade from your mind and metta will be left. And it's the same with practicing and developing insight into the three characteristics, or what we call vipassana. Vipassana meditation also leads to metta because you're seeing the impermanent and selfless nature of mental states, including ill will. So your mind naturally lets go of ill will. It sees it as suffering, doesn't want suffering, so it lets go of ill will. And any time you have the mindfulness and insight to let go of ill will, then what's left is going to be metta, goodwill. 
So people have advanced their practice to the point where they've had deep insight, experience of samadhi and deep insight, then quite naturally they have a lot of metta in their mind. They have kindness, compassion, mudita, sympathetic joy and equanimity. These four Brahma Viharas will develop quite naturally and be there in the mind all the time. So the best people of all to have practiced and developed metta are the arahants, enlightened beings, monks, nuns, men, women who have completed the Eightfold Noble Path, Noble Eightfold Path. They, uh, they have naturally, they have metta in their minds all the time because they have no more anger or ill will or hatred left. They've abandoned it. So they quite naturally have metta. And you feel it. When, you, when we were around Ajahn Chah, you could feel the power of his metta all the time. And many other teachers who have attained Nibbana, you just feel the kindness and compassion even when they're not speaking. You can still feel it. And it has very great, a great effect on people. People with a lot of suffering would go to see someone like Ajahn Chah and sit, talk to him for a while and they'd feel like all their suffering had disappeared. Maybe they'd, he'd be able to get them to laugh at, and see their the foolishness of their attachment and their suffering or at least soothe them, just being in his presence, give them some wisdom, give them some encouragement. Even animals would feel the metta of Ajahn Chah. So there's that famous story when the Air Force officers were coming to see Ajahn Chah in the afternoon one day at Wabapong, his monastery, and he was with the monks sweeping leaves in the main area. And as the soldiers walked towards him, a cobra came out and uh, was between the soldiers and Ajahn Chah and the cobra seeing a lot of people walking towards it. it probably got disturbed so it put its hood up and uh, it stopped and lifted its head off the ground and was swaying there in a sort of defensive posture and the soldiers thought they should get a stick or something and attack it because it's a poisonous snake but Ajahn Chah said, no, don't do that. And he went over and he just gently talked to the snake and uh, just tapped it on the head and then it went away. So even animals can be subdued by the metta of somebody with a lot of metta. So it can be in any posture, in any situation. And that is one of the goals of our practice is to free the mind from mental defilements in all postures all situations. Another question. Lumpur, I try to avoid using the word I more so to overcome the delusion of self and ego. During cultivation and contemplation, the mind is aware that craving and defilement are the cause of suffering. With continuous mindfulness, watching the breath, there is also an awareness that there is this self that binds with the five aggregates, seeing them as I, mine, myself, that is causing suffering. That being the case, is it befitting to say that for final liberation, one has to unveil the self that is binding the five aggregates besides removing clinging and defilements. I would appreciate your advice. Well, um, if you read the, Anap uh, the Anatalakana Sutta, the teaching on the characteristic of non-self, the way the Buddha was encouraging us to contemplate is question our experience. That's one way we start to dissolve this view of self or 
identification with body, mind, or five candors as self. Question. Is uh, this body, the physical form made up of four elements, is it permanent or impermanent? I think most people would agree physical form, the body is impermanent. Our body, other people's bodies are impermanent. They're changing, <coughs> they're aging, and eventually they will stop working. That's called death. So is what is impermanent happiness or suffering? Well, what is subject to impermanence and change and degeneration can't be seen as happiness, true happiness, because it doesn't last. And the changes bring with them a lot of pain and discomfort as well. So what is impermanent, unsatisfactory or not happiness, but suffering, is it correct to take it as self? So this body, if you take it as a self, that means there's a, a person, a being who owns this body or is this body. But if it was a self, you should be able to control it and command it and say, don't get old, don't have painful feelings, don't get sick and don't change on me, keep looking good and feeling good and don't die. But we can't do that. So this is the way of investigation or developing insight into the three characteristics and it's dissolving the delusion or illusion of self. And we can apply that way of tech, that technique of questioning and investigation to all of the five candors so body, feelings, perceptions, mental formations, sense consciousness. Questioning, looking, learning. And this is how we develop insight, wisdom. Even before then, just bringing up the quality of mindfulness in the present moment the sense of I starts to dissolve, doesn't it? Because mindfulness is rooted in equanimity. So a moment of mindfulness is a moment where equanimity, keeping the mind in the middle towards experience, is established. And so this sense of self, which is usually um, observed as our desires, our thoughts, our feelings, and identifying with them. When mindfulness arises, we stop doing that for a moment and we are observing from a place of, you might say, neutrality or observing, witnessing experience, but without grasping at it with this sense of self. And when mindfulness is present, craving and clinging fades away from our experience. So the more mindfulness we have, the more we experience this sense of emptiness, we say. Emptiness of self, no self. And when you develop states of calm, stillness, samadhi, even though the roots, causes of our suffering and this attachment to self may still be there in the, in the, in the mind, when we experience a state of stillness, samadhi, the sense of self disappears, doesn't it? You can't even feel your body and your thoughts go quiet. You're aware, but your mind is not proliferating. So the sense of self seems to disappear. So as mindfulness is practiced, samadhi is experienced already, we're getting some insight into not-self. And if you have your mindfulness, you can still use the word I, you understand, it's just the uh, concept of self and it's convenient, it's a convenient convention for talking to other people. So, you know, some people say, I'm not going to use the word I, so I can get rid of this sense of self, but <laughs> it has to be done with mindfulness and insight, simply removing I from the conversation, me, not referring to a me or an I, won't do it. And it may make you a bit more mindful of your sense of self. But you know, even arahants will still use the word I. <laughs> you can experience Nibbana and still use that word. 
but there's no longer an attachment to it. And it's just seen as a convention, and that's all right. And we can use conventions. Like people think, well, an arahant doesn't need to eat food because they've reached nibbana. Well, they, they have no more craving for food because there's no more sense of self, but they still eat just to keep the body going while they're still alive. In the same way, we can use the word I, me, mine, myself. The arahant will use those words, but they're not attached to them or clinging to them. Another question. When we have made some mistakes in the past, do we have to confess the mistake to others in order for the bad karma to be cleaned? Or is it enough if we can just acknowledge the fault and try not to make the same mistake again? Well, karma that is being made, intentional action, that we've performed, good or bad, has been done in the past, we can't go back in time and change that. So the good that was done is good and will bring its good results. The bad that was done is bad and it will bring bad results of unhappiness and suffering. So we can't change the past, but we can learn from it and one of the ways you learn is becoming more mindful of what you've said and done the karma you've made and one way that you can do that is by revealing or explaining it to someone else so monks do that regularly as part of their training we we say confess offenses against the training discipline what it really means is revealing opening up to someone else what you said and done especially if you've broken a rule, you explain to someone else what you've done and they ask you, are you mindful now of what you've done? And you say, yes, I'm mindful and I'm going to make amends, I'm not going to do it again. You know, that's your intention, is not to repeat the same mistake or the same unskillful action. So karma we make on the level of body, speech and mind, but in terms of morality it's particularly body and speech. So we use precepts, five precepts, eight precepts, or the 227 precepts of a, a monk, or the nun's rules as well. We're using these to train ourselves, first of all, to have enough discipline to restrain the worst excesses of our mind so we don't make bad karma through body and speech. But we still may have those intentions arise that's why we need to practice mindfulness and meditation is to really purify the mind through developing insight and letting go of the unwholesome tendencies of mind greed, anger, delusion and we're doing that through meditation but the first area of practice is to not act or speak in unskillful ways and make bad karma through our speech and actions so that's done in the present moment, isn't it? You, you have the intention to refrain from killing or stealing or saying something that's hurtful and unskillful or not true. That kind of karma is made in the present moment to refrain from those unskillful behaviors. That's how you change your past karma, meaning you may have the tendency, the intention to come up to kill or steal or insult someone. So that's a mental thing, mental karma, it arises, but now you say, I'm not gonna act on this. So this is fresh, good karma in the present moment. I'm not gonna say or do anything harmful to myself or others in this moment. So you're changing the course of your life, literally. You're developing fresh new good karma by refraining from unwholesome karma and that's how you you change and one of the reasons you'll make those changes is because you see the harm the damage the suffering that's come from past actions but the very past actions you've made you can't change because they've already been done 
you can only learn from them by acknowledging them. So that partly maybe means talking to someone else who can give you good feedback, remind you to be more mindful, more careful. And when we do talk to others, it makes us very clear. It makes it clear because you're verbalizing it, explaining it. We can also do it on our own now. If we're just on our own and there's no one to talk to, well, you just make your, your own mental aspiration to change your habit so you don't hurt someone through your speech or actions as you have done in the past. So you can do it on your own, but talking to someone can help. But make sure you talk to someone who's trustworthy and they're not going to use it against you. So if you reveal your mistake to someone who's not trustworthy, they'll, they'll go away and gossip about you and make more trouble for you. So pick your friend. It should be a dumber friend who's trustworthy. But if there's no dumber friend around, well, you just do it for yourself. And make yourself mindful of where you've made errors and done things that are unskillful and then you f develop fresh new intentions, good intentions. But you still have to receive the fruits of your old karma, there's no way around that. So even arahants are receiving the fruits of their past karma. So the famous cases of Angulimala, who had killed many people in the past and then he became an arahant after meeting the Buddha he practiced hard and became an arahant he let go of all his defilements but when he went out for arms round into the village people reacted very badly because they knew who he was from the past they were still perceiving him in his old past life as a murderer and so they'd run away from him or shout at him or insult him or even throw stones at him. And the last thing they wanted to do was give him food. So he'd go back to the monastery with an empty bowl, but he wasn't sad or angry about that fact. He just accepted this is my past karma giving its result. And the other monks out of compassion and faith that he was an arahant, they would share their food with him. And so he always had enough food but he would get it from the other monks, not from the lay people. So even arahants can have accidents sometimes, or people don't like them, or things go wrong. I remember one time, Ajahn Mahabua was involved in a car crash, and the car rolled, and his attendant monk, Ajahn Noi, got a bad back from that accident. Ajahn Mahabur said, this is his old karma, got a serious back injury. Ajahn Mahabur had a few bruises, but nothing serious. But he said, this is old karma coming back. And even an arahant can experience old karma. They can't change that. But they're no longer attached with a sense of self. And they're only making, they're only doing good things now. Another question, when one human body dies, if the consciousness gets reborn into a, as a ghost, then does that ghost still have memories about its past life as a human? No, no, I haven't died yet, so I can't really answer this. Uh, but they say yes, quite often, Ghosts and devas, beings that are born in these realms where it's spontaneous birth. So a deva is spontaneous birth. Ghosts are spontaneously born in those realms. Because of the spontaneous birth, then they tend to remember the, the karma that has led to them being reborn in that realm. Uh, so there are stories from the suttas of say, ghosts and devas who knew what happened that led them to that re rebirth of in a place of woe, like a ghost, or a place of happiness, like a deva. But whether, even if you can remember your past mistakes, whether you've learned your lesson yet or not is another question, isn't it? So maybe a, a ghost might still might remember what 
bad karma they did in the previous life that led to them to be reborn as a ghost, but whether they make the aspiration to stop making that bad karma, that's a different question. They may not see it as bad karma. They might remember, but they might not um, have any wish to change their habit or do things differently. And that will depend on the development of right view, wisdom faculty. That might depend on hearing Dhamma from a good teacher. Maybe that ghost doesn't hear any good Dhamma, so maybe they don't change it. So there's many factors in terms of the development of people's spiritual path, even after they die as a human and are reborn in another realm. There's many factors at work here. Ideally, as you're alive now, you know, develop strong faith in Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, listen to the Dhamma, reflect on the Dhamma, practice the Dhamma, then your mind will be less and less like the mind of a ghost, less and less suffering, and you have right view established, and whatever happens after you die, you're in the best state to face it. Ideally, you know, develop the Eightfold Path to the point where you're at least a Sotapanna in this life. Then you don't have to be reborn in any of the lower realms. You won't be reborn as a ghost or as an animal or in a hell realm. You've stopped making the worst kind of karmas. And uh, you're on the path to Nibbana. That's an aspiration that all Buddhists should really maintain in their heart. Another question. Lumpur, please can you explain the term Sangwega? Well, if you do the morning chanting, you look at our morning chanting in the chanting book, you see the second passage in the morning chanting is that we uh, recite verses to arouse Sangwega. So this is a karmically good quality. It's a wholesome quality of mind. It's sometimes translated as uh, a sense of urgency. Urgency for what? Or well, urgency to practice, to put one's effort into the practice of developing the path, sila, samadhi, panya. Because it's very easy to become complacent in life, not have a sense of urgency, not to wake up to the truth. So another part of Sangwega is, we say, it's this the sobering up of the mind. The Buddha said, you know, as human beings, we get intoxicated with our situation, our life situation, and that can be bad or good, but we get intoxicated, which means we're kind of drunk. We don't see the truth. We don't see the path out of suffering yet. We're maybe not looking for one. We're just caught up in our existence, the happiness, the suffering, the good things, the bad things sense of self, the attachment to body and mind, the attachment to family, possessions, all the things of life, we get attached and we get kind of intoxicated. So in order to pursue the path to develop insight into the Four Noble Truths, we need to wake up or sober up a bit. Then we see the need to practice. So what sobers people up? Well, um, Often, you know, sometimes on these sessions I talk about the um, biographies of different teachers and you see over and over again one of the most common factors in getting someone to start practicing the Dhamma following the Buddha is a death of someone close to them. So a parent or a brother or sister or a close friend, they die and it sobers you up, doesn't it? When someone close to you dies, it wakes you up to the reality that life is impermanent, death can come at any time, uh, and because of that, uh, because our life is uncertain, we should really practice, put our effort into the practice, because we don't know how long we've got, we don't know what lies ahead, and our mind is maybe not yet firm in the Dhamma, we haven't had true insight, our mind is not truly peaceful and happy yet. So we should practice, and death tends to stimulate that. 
you know, if you lose somebody close to you, you really it can be really shocking and then often it leads to sangwega and the sad, seeing the sadness of life, you know, people you love and like pass away, then you really see, hmm, I should put my effort into the practice. Other things sober us up as well, bring some way, maybe just seeing somebody fall by the wayside, somebody who's been successful, wealthy or in a happy situation, and then they lose their way and they get caught into unskillful ways of behavior, and then you meet them or hear about them and you see the sadness of their life. It makes you want to do more good and practice the path more because you're seeing the sadness of someone who's not practicing. It could be, I remember one one young man I knew, he uh, was born into a really very wealthy family and had every privilege, every good good fortune, and loving parents, a loving sister. He became addicted to drugs and even became a dealer. And then he was arrested and he was put in prison for a few years. And just to see that fall from being, having every advantage, every good opportunity, and then just fall into being caught into prison and the suffering of that. It was a real, we say, some gives rise to some wager. Or it could be something more natural, just like illness. You know, people fall ill and you see the sadness of that. So it makes you want to practice more, put effort into your practice. Another question. Is it correct that morality is one factor leading to Nibbana? However, the five or the eight precepts is only enough for a Sotapanna, so only 227 rules can eventually lead to full enlightenment. Well, if you read the suttas and the commentaries, you'll see that people practicing the five precepts can certainly become sotapanna. It's the minimum requirement, isn't it? You know, to commit to and become used to keeping the five precepts to the point where they just become your normal way of living in the world. You, know, you quite naturally shy away from killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, lying, and taking drink and drugs. It just becomes your normal way. And so those intentions to kill, steal, disappear from the mind through the practice, through understanding good and bad karma, through wanting to develop the mind to the point where it abandons greed, anger, and delusion. You know, it just becomes the normal way of behavior. So the eight precepts expand on that and they're particularly supportive of developing samadhi, which is one factor of the, the path, developing renunciation, simplicity of life, not eating in the evening, not indulging in entertainments, not decorating the body and you know, getting into makeup and fashion and so on, and then sleeping on a simple bed. These These eight precepts are helping you to streamline your behavior, simplify your life, renounce some of the luxuries and unnecessary things in life so that you can really focus on developing mindfulness and meditation, make the mind one-pointed. Um, strictly speaking, if you develop the eight precepts, you know, that will support insight to the level of an anagami one who's given up all attachment to the body, greed, anger, sensuality. Um, one could, on the eight precepts, also develop arahata magga and become an arahant, but then usually, they say, one who attains nibbana will go and live in a monastery. That's the most obvious thing to do, isn't it? You, you have no more reason to be out in the world earning a living, you would be living more like a monk or a nun, whether it's in a monastery or in a more monastic situation like a hermitage, or at least in a situation where one's a little bit separate from a lot of the activities of lay people in the world. 
Um, so the eight precepts, sometimes eight preceptors do attain Nibbana. But ideally, by that time, you know, in, in this modern era, most of the people I've heard who have attained Magapala, they may have begun as a lay person, keeping five precepts or eight precepts, attain maybe Sotapati, Maga, Pala. They tend to then take higher ordination. Generally, that's the pattern, because it's the most obvious thing to do. And they uh, will become a monk or a nun. And the Vinaya of training of a monk or a nun, a monastic, is you know, it's the most suitable training for attaining Nibbana. It's a refinement of mindfulness, a refinement of skillful behavior, body, speech, and mind, and a you know, refinement of insight and wisdom as well. The uh, bhikkhu vinaya or the bhikkhuni vinaya, it's, it's streamlining our behavior, training us in wholesome dhammas, body, speech, and mind, so very supportive for developing samadhi and an insight through vipassana. So if one is able to do that, then it's probably the best vehicle for attaining Nibbāna. But it doesn't mean to say one can't practice with the five or the eight precepts. It's just it's a slightly better vehicle. Another question, is the first stage of jhana necessary for Nibbāna? Well, I would think so. You study the Eightfold Noble Path, Samma Samadhi, it's four jhanas there. So we're really aiming to develop that, all eight factors of the Noble Path, and that includes the, the uh, factor of Samma Samadhi. But having said that, as we practice, we may not yet have experience of jhana, and that's fine. You just develop the best quality and sustain the best level of mindfulness that you can. And what is samadhi? Well, it's the continuous presence of mindfulness. And so people would say to Ajahn Chah, how much samadhi do I need? Do I need jhana? Do I need samadhi to attain uh, the noble path and develop insight? And he say, well, you need as much samadhi as you, you need to contemplate develop insight. So even a moment of mindfulness can be enough, what we call kanika samadhi, momentary concentration. You can see the impermanent nature of your candors in a brief moment, can't you? You can see a thought arise and pass away. You can see feelings changing, pleasure, pain, neutral feeling. You can observe the changing nature of the body, sensations and different aspects of the physical form. You can, arise, you can observe thought formations, mental states arising, passing away. You know, we can do all this with just a, the briefest moment of mindfulness if we direct it to develop insight, observe anicca, dukkha, anatta in our experience. So where does Nibbāna come from? It comes from that cultivating the factors of the path from moment to moment. So we can almost set aside the question of do we need jhana or not and really just look at whether I'm mindful or not from moment to moment through my day. If I'm not mindful, how can I bring up the effort to re-establish or establish mindfulness, clear comprehension, and then observe the true nature of phenomena, which is that they're impermanent, unsatisfactory, and without self. You keep doing that, while well, your mind is refining, you'll, you'll keep going beyond the hindrances, and then you'll, keep, you'll be able to abandon greed, anger, and delusion more and more. So perhaps that's another way of looking at it. Just maintain mindfulness and keep contemplating the uncertainty, the impermanence of phenomena. And out of that, one day Nibbāna will arise. Another question. One eon in Buddhist cosmology could also mean the length of the time when one universe expands until it shrinks and ends. 
Well, usually they call a kalpa or maha kalpa, one world, the time of one world system, isn't it? The, the arising and then the expansion and then the disintegration of a world system. You could say that's a universe. Um, an eon is considered an incalculable period of time. I think there's one simile somewhere, whether it's from a commentary, probably from a commentary rather than the Buddha, but I think it said if it, if you had the worst possible rain every day, all day, all night for three years, the number of drops of rain that fell would be less than an eon. <laughs> That's three days and three years of 24 hours a day the heaviest rain the world has ever seen would be the number of drops that fell would be less than an eon. <laughs> so it's a long time. We say an in incalculable period of time. So it's probably the universe is being created and expanded and then contracted and disappeared many times during an eon, I would say. A kalpa is a shorter period and the Buddha had a few similes for that. One is if you think of the highest mountain in the world made of solid rock and so higher than Mount Everest and then a guy comes along with the most refined kind of cloth from the best cloth market in India. He buys this really nice piece of cloth and then once every hundred years he strokes the top of this mountain made of solid granite, solid rock, the time it would take to wear down that rock mountain to nothing is less than one kalpa, if I remember. <laughs> so a, kal a kalpa is already a long time, an eon is an immeasurable long time. So they're just sort of giving you guidelines that the, the universe has been around a long time, this world has been here a long time, but this world one day will end. You know, as science predicts, the sun will expand and it will blow up and the world will heat up and then it will disintegrate and then there'll be a period with no world and then later on there'll be another world, just as before this world there were previous worlds. And this is what we call sangsara, you know, the endless kind of timelessness of, of existence and, and the experience of the, the universe and time and space and so on. So it's a long, long, long time. And the Buddha said he looked back to the beginning of time and the beginning of the universe or the beginning of beings who live in sangsara and he couldn't find it. It's just kind of endless which is another reason that gives rise to sang, sang, a sangwega, this sense of urgency to practice, because we're just stuck in this endless cycle of birth and death. So keep practicing for and get out of it. And that's, you know, letting go of the delusion of self brings the mind to the unconditioned, and we escape sangsara, because it's just endless. So last question, when Nibbāna is the only unborn, uncreated and unformed, in what way are space and vijnana, not sense consciousness, born, created and formed? Well, they're born, created and formed because of mental defilements, kalesa, greed, anger, delusion, which are coming from ignorance, not knowing the Four Noble Truths, not knowing the truth. The mind is covered over by ignorance and this manifests as sense of self. So in, as long as there's ignorance conditioning the mind, then there'll be um, craving, clinging, becoming, birth. This is the Buddhist, Buddha's explanation of how suffering arises. So because of ignorance we cling to the five candors, body and mind or body feelings 
thought formation and sense consciousness as self. The mind through its delusion or ignorance creates this sense of self which identifies with body and mind. And that includes space. You know, you have a body, there's space in the body. So even the space, you know, your nostrils are space. <laughs> you're clinging, as long as you have ignorance in the mind, you're clinging to your nostrils as self, my nostrils. You're clinging to that space or identifying with that space amongst other space. There's many different kinds of space in your body as self. Ear holes, my ear holes, my mouth, you open your mouth, there's space. You know, all the different orifices and spaces in this body, you, as long as there's ignorance conditioning our consciousness, we take them as self, my space. And consciousness the same, as long as there's ignorance, consciousness is taken as self. And this is where karma is generated, we create good and bad karma which leads to a knock-on effect and more moments of consciousness arise with a sense of self because we've had a previous one then we have another one and then another and then another so consciousness is constantly kind of linking from one moment to the next with this sense of self so it's actually you know life is a made up of distinct separate moments of consciousness but the delusion is that there's this solid self continuous self in the midst of it and we keep uh, experiencing that so we have this feeling like I am born, I am growing up, I am living, working, doing this, doing that, I am seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, smelling and the, the sense of I just keeps traveling or migrating along with it because it's, it's born of delusion. But when we develop the Eightfold Path, we're developing the skills, the mindfulness, the clarity, the insight and the investigative wisdom to see through that and say, and there, where is the self in this? Can you find the self in form, feeling, thoughts, sense consciousness? And the Buddha said, you can't. You, you, but we're not just to believe the Buddha, he's investigate for yourself. And this is where you free yourself from suffering by letting go of the delusion of self in your experience. It's peaceful, it's nice, it's good, it's happy. When the self disappears, it's a great relief and the mind starts to feel better. It, it's purified every time there's a bit of insight into the non-self, there's a purification taking place until eventually, you know, the arahant has no more delusion of self, no more sense of self arising with consciousness. So consciousness is purified. It's not that they don't have consciousness anymore. They still have candors, but there's no sense of self grasping at, at the candors or being created with the candors, seeing the candors as within the self or the self within the candors or as the same thing or as neither the same thing nor different. All the different views that come from delusion have gone. We can only know this through our experience. We have to practice. It's not a, a belief or a theory. You may begin like that, but we have to practice it. So that's the last of the questions tonight. Um, I hope some of those answers were helpful to you. And we'll leave it there. Wish you all well. I don't know.